Nile O'Keefe here, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior associate in Bard in Dublin. I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to this episode of the Barden and Cassai webinar series. As we fast approach the end of training contracts in October and April, we want to talk to you today on the salaries for newly qualified accountants based on the recent salary survey published in partnership with the Chartered Accountants Ireland Linster Society. Before we jump straight into it, just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we start. Firstly, on entry, everyone has been muted and should have their cameras turned off. So you might just double check if this is the case for you. Secondly, if you have any questions over the course of the webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to cover these at the end of our conversation, time allowing. Thirdly, we are also recording the session, a copy of which will be available afterwards, should you wish to get it. So now, in terms of background on myself, as you can tell from the accent, I'm originally from Cork. I did my undergrad and master's in accounting in UCC. I then completed my training contract in Deloitte's, uh, Deloitte Cork's CTB Industry Audit Department. And then I decided to use my qualification in a different way and joined Barden in November 2021, the week after my training contract ended, actually. So I worked alongside Bernie Duffy and Brian O'Connor on the recently qualified accounting team in Barden, Dublin. This team has helped many of your former colleagues secure roles as they left contract over the last few years. So today, we thought it would be quite useful to ask my colleague Brian some of the questions you guys may have on your mind. Brian is our recently qualified team lead in Dublin. Originally from Dublin, he completed his training contract in Deloitte in the Financial Services Audit Department. Then he gained some post-qualified experience in industry over two years stint living in Melbourne. And then upon returning to Dublin, he joined Barden in 2020. So that's the intro is done. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to speak a bit, little bit more about money and salaries, a topic that most people should find interesting, fair to say. So as a newly qualified accountant coming out of a training contract this year or next year, there are lots of things you'll be thinking about. For many people, just like you, money is usually high on the agenda. You have, after all, worked hard and sacrificed a lot so it's only right to be compensated fairly for the value of your time. So a couple of questions that you may be wondering about. Firstly, what's the average salary for a newly qualified accountant? Very important. Secondly, you may have heard contradicting figures out there. And you might wonder what information is accurate and what can I rely on? The usual crack at the water cooler that Sarah got 60K, but John got 65K. What's the story there? So what does that mean? Why is there such a range in salaries? How can you accurately benchmark my salary against the going rate out there? So most salary surveys that you may have already seen online give you an average or a range. But depending on the sample size, this average figure can be skewed and often doesn't give a true reflection of the actual base salary. So from our side, in order to avoid any of these assumptions, we've used real life data from the Chartered Accountants Linster Society Salary Survey, which was published recently with over 1,000 members of the Chartered Accountants Ireland um, participating in the survey. So this is live, this is current, and we felt it was the fairest reflection of what's happening on the ground in both Linster and Munster. So without further ado, this is where Brian takes the stage. Well, Brian, nice to have you on. We might start, I suppose, with some of the key takeaways we can take from the salary survey for newly qualified accountants. Thanks, Niall. Lovely introduction as always. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Brian. Thanks a million for logging on. So I suppose we'll jump straight into it and look at the um, average base salaries across a couple of different um, areas for coming from the Leinster Salary Survey. So just important to remember at this stage, um, these are the Leinster base figures first. We'll dig a little deeper and look at Dublin and Munster as well. Um, so the average basic salary 
for all newly qualified accountants across all sectors in Leinster came out at 59.5 thousand euro. Um, the average salary package for newly qualified accountants in industry came out at 68.2 thousand euro. Um, so this is the average salary plus all benefits, i.e. the basic salary plus different benefits like potential bonus, healthcare cover, pensions, etc. If we strip away, um, or sorry, that was for industry only. If we look at both industry and practice, the average salary package across both of these came out at 62.8 thousand euro. So again, slight decrease when you look at both industry and practice. Again, that is inclusive of base salary plus all added benefits. Um, but as I mentioned before, these numbers are reflecting the whole of Leinster. So as you might expect, there'll be a bit of a difference between Leinster or outside Dublin and Dublin for salaries. Um, so if we look at Dublin specifically, we've used internal data from Barden's own placements over the last year or so. And we can see that the average salary for Dublin in H1 2023 is now 62.9 thousand euro, um, which is an increase of nearly 1.5K from H2 2022. Um, and that's just base salary, not in, non-inclusive of benefits. Um, so again, lots of good news there, some high numbers, um, but these increases are as a result of demand being higher than supply. So there's unprecedented demand for newly qualified accountants at the moment. Um, and we'll, we'll dip into the whole supply and demand thing in a little bit more detail later on. Great. Thanks, Brian. Sounds like all great news for, for newly qualified accountants in Leinster. I suppose, how do these figures then compare to Munster at the moment? Yeah, so good news for Munster too. There's definitely been an increase in the total remuneration for newly qualified accountants over the last year. Um, we used, again, our own internal data for this, and we can see that the median salary in H1 2023 was up to €57,500, um, up from €55,000 in H2 last year, so an increase of 2.5K. Um, the averages came out at €56,750, up from €55,3K in H2 2022. So again, material shifts um, upwards in both median and base salary in consecutive half years. And similar to Leinster, this is a reflection of intense demand for newly qualified accountants in Cork and wider Munster. Um, as in the case with Leinster, it's the same unprecedented demand for newly qualified accountants. And this is due to a number of factors, people moving abroad, increased hiring, and um, other things like that, which we'll dig into a little bit later. Conscious um, at this point, we've thrown a lot of numbers out there. It's come thick and fast, so it might be hard to follow. But all of these figures are available on the Barden website. So we have brand new blogs released this week on both the Munster salaries, the Dublin salaries, and you can see the wider Leinster salaries um, on the Leinster and Bar Leinster Society salary survey, which is on the Barden website as well. Oh, great, great for Munster so as well. Um, and I suppose, Brian, were there any other key takeaways from the salary survey worth noting at this point? Um, yeah, so there were, like the salary survey, obviously, the... It gives away in the name that it's focused on salaries, but we track a lot of other details as part of it. So one area that's worth noting is around hybrid working. Um, and some of the interesting points came out that um, 75% of people who took the survey are now working some sort of hybrid arrangement, which is up 2% from last year. However, the number of members working fully remotely has dropped from 13% to 10%. So 3% less people working fully remote roles. Um, and also for those who are working some sort of hybrid arrangement, the average time spent in the office last year was 42%. This has had a significant increase to 57% this year. So that equates to almost one extra day a week in the office. 
Last year, people were working on average two days a week in the office. That's shifted upwards to three days a week in the office. So I think it's safe to say that hybrid working isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. But what this data does tell us is that there's a clear increase in the time people are spending in the office and expected to spend in the office. Interesting, Brian. I suppose that certainly resonates to me, given I'm a Cork man, commutes to works in Dublin. Def, definitely food for thought that the hybrid's coming back in in a big way. Um, so, so yeah, Brian, it seems like the market this year is just as strong as it as last year. Um, looking at the numbers, I suppose still lots of demand, limited supply. How do you see this kind of playing out over the next few months into next year? Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball. It's very hard to predict what might happen. If I say one thing, the opposite might happen. Um, but look, newly qualified salaries, it's similar to the property market. The jobs market and salaries are based on the simple concepts of supply and demand, which we've touched on a couple of times. So if we look at demand first, demand for newly qualified accountants has been particularly high over the last couple of years since the pandemic. We expect this to ease off at some point um, and level off. So this will in turn affect salaries, which might plateau. So over time, we probably won't see these same increases year on year. We might see a bit more consistent level in terms of salaries. Again, it's hard to say if this will happen next month, six months, a year's time. Um, very hard to predict when that'll happen, but we'd be expecting it to happen at some point. Um, and then if we look at the supply side, so a lot of newly qualified accountants and accountants with one year, two year, three years post-qualified um, are opting to travel, move abroad. Now, I know this is nothing new. Irish people love to move abroad. It's always been a thing. However, this will affect supply. So supply has been generally low to the amount of people leaving. There's not as many people coming back from abroad um, because obviously during the pandemic, people weren't leaving. Um, so again, another thing to take into account, and we'd expect this to continue continue for the rest of 2023 and lead into 2024. Thank, thanks, Brian. Very, very insightful there. I, I suppose we spoke a lot about base salary today, but mm -hmm. a lot of people watching, they want to know about the overall package. What, what other benefits could a newly qualified accountant expect? Yeah, so this is a good point. And I know, like having trained and practiced myself, other benefits didn't really come into play. But now, as you look elsewhere, you look into industry or now that you're qualified, benefits become a thing. Um, and it's very, very good to kind of get the full picture as to what you're entitled to. So benefits will vary comp company to company. But in addition to base salary, the most common benefits a company would offer are potential bonus, pension contributions, and healthcare contributions. So we'll run through all them and a couple of other ones. Um, if we start with bonuses, so these are typically based on a percentage of your base salary. So which on average at this level, our own internal, internal data tells us that it's around 6%. Um, so 6% annual bonus on your basic salary as a newly qualified accountant. Um, the percentage usually isn't guaranteed. It can be dependent on individual performance, company performance, and a lot of the time it's a combination of both. The next important benefit we'll touch on is pension contributions. Um, so don't be surprised if these don't kick in from day one. A lot of the time, pension contributions start after your six-month probation period is completed. Um, so that's just one thing to bear in mind. We see these commonly around the 5% of base salary. Um, and the way it's structured is, or the common scenario is that you'd make your own contribution into a pension plan and the company matches that with X percentage. Um, sometimes the company will pay a pension contribution without you having to contribute yourself, but that's less common. Um, another common one then is healthcare. So it's not always guaranteed, but a lot of companies do pay it. Sometimes it's paid in the form of a cash contribution. So you might be given an extra 1,000 euro to put towards a health insurance plan of your choice. Other times the company will have a company policy and you can just opt in to join the wider company policy. Do bear in mind that this can sometimes be um, subject to tax, benefit in kind tax. 
Um, so don't be surprised if there is um, a tax implication. And um, when it comes to healthcare, we usually see around 64% of businesses paying this at the newly qualified level. Um, so not always guaranteed. Another benefit, um, which people sometimes forget, but important to consider is your annual leave allowance. So the menu, minimum annual leave allowance that a company can give is 20 days. However, on average, um, we see around the 24 day mark is the most common. Um, be sure to keep an eye, an eye out for company days as well. So you'll have your normal annual leave days, but some companies give the likes of Christmas Eve, Good Friday, as extra company days. So this can be on top of your annual leave. Um, one thing that I did notice after finishing a practice is the likes of overtime or time off in lieu are a lot less common in industry. So don't be surprised or shocked if this isn't a thing anymore. You may not be able to rack up all these hours and take two months off in the summer. Unfortunately, that might be a thing of the past. Um, and then lastly, some other less common benefits. There's all kinds of different things company offer. Um, employee share option schemes can become a thing. That usually comes at a later stage in your career. Um, well-being, gym contributions, allowances for those. Um, some companies pay that out. And then there's smaller things like subsidized lunches, canteens, free parking, all sorts of things. So always get the full picture when you're considering what's out there. Thanks, Brian. Very, very comprehensive overview of the benefits there. And look, it's always nice to have a few extras thrown in. So I suppose one thing that's really important to note at this point is that while salary will be an important component in the decision for that first post-practice move, it shouldn't be the only component in the decision-making process. Your first few years post-qualified experience, PQE, should really be about getting good experience, working with great people, and of course, getting fairly paid while you do so. So it's not really about your base salary now. It's about what your base salary will be in three, five, 10 years time. And for the 20 to 30 years after that, we, we always say in Barden um, that earning follows learning, not the other way around. So we might quickly touch on another question, Brian, that, that crops up as we approach the end of our training contracts in October or April. A lot of people commonly ask us, when should I start my search? What are the, what, like Brian, what are the usual timelines for a job search these days? Yeah, that's a good question, Niall, and something we can both relate to. I know you were a very quick turnaround between finishing the training contract and starting with Barden. I took a couple of months off to go enjoy myself. So what it really comes down to is your own personal preferences, your own personal circumstances what's important to you and what you want to do. So first things first, start with an ideal start date. So when do you, when would you really like to start a new role? Some people, as I said, want to start something straight away. They want to have something lined up for the week after their contract completion date. Other people might want to take a week or two off to recharge. Other people might want to take a few months off to travel, to explore, whatever the hell they want to do. Um, so choose that ideal start date and then work backwards. Um, two months out from that ideal start date could be a good time to get the ball rolling. Um, and the reason we say two months, there's a couple of factors to take on board. So firstly, when you go out to industry, um, when you get permanent positions after training contract, it's not uncommon for people to have one, two or three month notice periods. As a result of that, hiring managers know if they interview someone, they really like them, they offer them the role. It's not uncommon to have to wait two or three months before that person's actually sat in the desk. And um, so that kind of means that if you are a couple of months out, it's not too early to start looking. Another thing to consider is most interview processes take time. It can be anywhere from two or three weeks. Some are longer, some are shorter. And um, so this is another timeline to factor into your um, into those two months and finally unfortunately you may not get the first role you interview for sometimes you can go through a couple of processes and get very unlucky so you might have to factor in two or three week interview process here followed by another one followed by another one and um, so when you take all that into account two months three months it's not too early however as i mentioned before it's really up to the individual 
Um, not everyone wants to have something lined up immediately. Everyone has different circumstances. So figure out what's important to you, focus on that start date and work from there. On the flip side, we've met some people who uh, want to have something lined up straight away and they are very proactive. They've got things lined up months in advance. Other people, they don't even think about it until they finish the training contract. Um, but just to reiterate, two or three months before um, is a good timeline. And look, as I said, it's up to the individual. So if you do want like to discuss your own circumstances, feel free to reach out to myself, Niall, the wider Barden team. We can catch up for a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. We can hear your own plans, circumstances, whatever, and give you like bespoke advice on what might be a good timeline that works for you. Um, lastly, if you are at a contract the end of October, early November, even December, don't panic. It's not too it's not too late at all. You have a lot of time. So um don't panic. You can organize a conversation and take it from there. Exactly, Brian. We're always happy to have a chat, go through it with people. And look, be, before we go to the QA, because I'm sure a lot of people have have questions. We do want to mention our FAE Careers Evening in partnership with CASI, which are holding on Thursday, the 28th of September in Charter Accountants House on Pierce Street. So keep an eye for more info on that and on all the socials. Um, it'll be a great chance to discuss a lot of these topics face to face. Brian and I will be there, as will the cast I and, and the rest of the Barden team. So I think we're we're now on to the QA. Um let me check if any questions have come in um worth addressing. So I know a few were asked earlier. So Brian, here's an interesting one. So question here. Those benefits you spoke on earlier, are, are all of those guaranteed? Um, so in short, no. As I said, every company is different. Um, some companies will offer all of those benefits. Some companies will offer none. A lot of companies might offer one or two of them, different ones. So it's really dependent on the business and what their benefits package plan is. Um, what I would say, if someone is looking into applying for a role, try to get the full picture. If you're working with a recruiter, if you're working with HR, you should be able to get a full picture, all the percentages and know exactly what you're signing up for. Um, so yeah, try to get all the info, but it will change company to company. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And then the question here must be from someone in Cork or, or Munster. It's uh, why are the salaries lower? <coughs> so, right. Yeah, so really what it comes down to is cost of living expenses. Um, like rent, different cost of living will be more expensive in Dublin than let's say it is in Cork. So it's the same all across the globe. Salaries are higher in London than they are in Dublin because rent or their cost of living is more expensive there. So I suppose companies really need to, to attract talent, they really need to pay a salary that makes the cost of living achievable in those different places. And that's why it varies place to place. So no matter where you go, New York's probably more expensive than London. London's more expensive than Dublin. Dublin's more expensive than Cork. And the salaries are reflective of that. Yeah. Great. And I suppose one here, I suppose, um, would you recommend switching companies if your current company can match within 5K of that offer? So there's someone looking to switch and uh, there's a 5k difference. What's what's your advice on that, Brian? Um I what I would really say is don't base your decision solely on 5k difference. So focus on what like what the opportunity has to offer. Are you going to get good learning, good development? Will you get more exposure in that role? I suppose you want to avoid making a decision purely on salary especially such a small difference like if you take that 5k split it across 12 months after tax albeit it is an increase it's not as significant and um, focus on what focus on the opportunity that can maximize your earning potential in 10 years time as you touched on earlier Niall if you can get the learning the development the exposure the experience now you're giving yourself the best chance possible to increase your earning potential in 10 years time. So try to look at the long term and not the short term um, is what I'd say to that. Yeah. 
Great. Um, loads of questions come in. We we won't be able to get to them all, but we'll we'll get to as many <laughs> as we can. I suppose another person here um asked does taking a one year gap after working for a year post qualified affect your ability to get hired? Obviously not as related to salary, but something that's kind of relevant. Taking one year gap after working for a year P post qualified would would it look um badly towards right? Um, I wouldn't think so. <clears throat> like, look, if you're taking a break from your career, if you're taking a year off, um, as long as you can explain what was what you were doing for that 12 months or that year off, usually businesses are open to it. Like, people travel, people try different things, people have to live their lives. So hiring managers understand that. Um, what I would say, if if you're doing that every second year, <laughs> working one year on, one year off, for 10 years that might raise raise some eyebrows but one year off here to travel or to take a career break to raise a child whatever your reason is if you can explain that in an interview i don't think any business would have too much of an issue with that and then some someone here was asking are there still a lot of full year motors out there and um, obviously we touched on the, the hybrid working percentages in, in the salary survey and, and would these fully remote roles, would their salaries be higher or lower, would you think, Brian? Um, so, yeah, just the first part of that question, are there a lot of fully remote roles? Um, in short, there are some, like I think the salary said 10% of people are working fully remotely. Now, that's across all levels, not just newly qualified. Um, so I'd say you could probably reduce that number a bit for newly qualified accountants for a couple of reasons. That 10% probably includes people who may work in a business that doesn't have a fully remote policy, but because they've been there a long time, they've probably been there since before COVID. They've built the trust and they know the business, the business can trust them. So they might still be working remotely, even though the rest of the business isn't. Secondly, at this level, the newly qualified level, like... It's good to kind of be on site to learn from your team, to be able to ask questions. And um, people who've trained in practice probably know the benefits of having your team around you, being able to ask questions quickly. So there are fully remote roles out there, but I would say one in 10 or slightly less than that. Um, then going to the second part of your question, do they pay more or less? To be honest, it really depends. I would think there's no direct correlation between remote roles and high salaries or lower salaries. It'll depend on the company, the industry, the role itself. Same as with roles that are in the office or hybrid. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And I think, look, we've time for two more questions. Um, the first from Brian is, is there a massive disadvantage if you're in the insurance, banking, and aviation department in the big four? And you wanted to move industry completely, um, would they be at a disadvantage? Maybe the traditional industry audit trained um, person. Um, well, look, I wouldn't say it's a massive disadvantage, but at the same time, you have to think about everyone else that's out there competing for the same roles. So it's always easiest to move like for like. So if you trained in insurance, let's say it's easiest to move into insurance companies because you have that like-for-like -like industry experience. Same with people who trained with pharmaceutical clients. Um, so they've worked on a number of audits of pharmaceutical clients. It's easy easier to move into pharma businesses because you have some exposure to the industry. Now, in saying that, the market's quite good. Um, moves that can be difficult when the market isn't as good are more achievable now. So albeit it might be slightly more difficult for someone to move from insurance to, let's say, pharmaceuticals, it's not impossible. And um, what I would say is bringing it back to salaries, keep an open mind. If you can be more open minded, let's say there's a salary range, 60 to 65, let's say. If you do have to make a big jump from, let's say, one industry to a completely new industry, keep an open mind on the salary range. Try to think maybe... Should I be looking at the lower end of that range if there is a big learning curve for me because I haven't experienced that industry? So what I would say is not impossible. There will be competition out there. Try to think of how you can be flexible on different things like locations, salaries, et cetera, um, to give yourself the best chance of possible making that move. 
And this is something we can go into more detail in our one-to-one -one coaching sessions. And we'll also be touching on in the FAE careers night. Yeah, great. On, on the 28th of September. So last question, Brian, because um, you've answered a good few in fairness to you, um, is do companies in industry have a salary ladder um, so you know what the earning potential is in future years? So would that be accessible to people? Um, yes and no. So the first thing I'll say is it's definitely less structured than what let, let the people out there have trained in practice. It'll be less structured than that. I know from the graduate programs, you can expect if you're if you're hitting your performance targets, you go up X amount year and year and you'll get promoted from associate to senior associate to assistant manager and so on. Once you move into industry, it's less structured and there's less of a guarantee of those promotions and in turn those salary increases. Um, a lot of the time it can just be dependent on the performance of the company, your own performance and the growth, like do, do roles above you become available? So it's very much a gray area once you step into industry. Some businesses do have salary reviews. So maybe every January you might sit down, they'll discuss your performance, they'll have a salary review. Other businesses, they might have inflation increases. So there'd be a percentage increase on salaries to go in line with inflation. Other businesses, they will have a kind of structured thing and might be X percentage every year to a point. Um, so again, it depends massively on the business, um, but it is less structured and less common or less structured and less guaranteed than it is in practice. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. I suppose, look, we, we'll finish up there. Um, a, a lot of questions seem to be people maybe joining late asking what was the salary, average salary for, for Munster and, and Linster for newly qualified accountants. This session is being recorded. It'll be put up um, on, on Baron's website and, and our YouTube channel and, and on, on various socials. So any questions, we did not get to anything you missed, you'll be able to access it. Um, and look, we'll do up a blog to answer any, any additional questions that were there as well. And we'll publish it on the Baron website. So, so don't worry, um, you'll be covered. So look, if you're curious to learn more, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Brian on LinkedIn, or on our emails. Mine is niall.okeefe at barden.ie. Brian's is brian.oconnor at barden.ie. Or else you can link in with the team in Dublin or Cork, and they'll set up a one-to-one -one advisory session for you, tailored towards you and your situation, and advise you on your search. So after all, you've worked hard enough to get there. So just, and, and look, just one more reminder, our CASI FAE Careers Evening on the 28th of September in Chartered Accountants House on Pier Street. Brian and I will be there and, and the wider team at CASI. So everyone, that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us and hopefully you found the session helpful. We'll be back soon with our next webinar with CASI. Keep an eye on socials for further updates. Thanks as always to Brendan, Suvi, Evan, the wider cast side committee for organizing today. Thanks for attending and have a lovely weekend. Thanks everyone. See you soon.